For the contract API, the main class we need to look at is contract. So let me just search for that here and I'll pull up the definition of contract. And if you remember the contract state interface, that was a simple interface that marked a class as a um, state class. Well, the contract interface does the same thing, but marks a class as a contract class. And contract has a single function that needs to be overridden, which is this verify function. And verify takes a ledger transaction as input and you perform uh, checking on that transaction. If you're happy with the transaction, then you return nothing. If for any reason you're unhappy with the transaction, if the number of inputs, outputs, commands is wrong, or if the contents of those objects are wrong, or if perhaps the required signers are wrong, then you need to throw in a legal argument exception. And when verifying a transaction, if the contracts of any of the states in the transaction throw in a legal argument exception, then the transaction overall is considered invalid. If none of the contracts of any of the states in the transaction throw an exception, only then is the transaction considered valid. And the next step is to now define our own contract, just to show you how it works. So if you remember in the previous uh, live coding session, we defined this house state. And if you remember house state was a class that implemented the contract state interface. So instances of that class represented states on the ledger. And it had two fields, an address field of type string and an owner field of type party. And here we have a constructor where it takes the address and the owner, some getters, and we've created our house state here. And it's also got this git participants method down here. And the one of the participants, the only participant in this case is the owner. So that means that the owner is the person who's notified of changes to state issuance, modification, destruction. So let's write the contract that would govern the um, this house state. So I'm going to go here and create a new file, Java class, and call this house contract. So here we have our house contract class. And the first thing I need to do to make this a contract is to implement the contract interface. And that obviously requires us to implement the verify method, which is the only method in the contract interface. And verify is where I'm going to have to impose rules on what um, a valid house transaction looks like. So we can think about this here. So what would be the um, simplest verify method? Remember that the verify method either throws a legal argument exception if it considers a transaction invalid or returns nothing if it considers a transaction valid. Well, the simplest verify we could actually write is just nothing, right? So here we have the simplest verify possible. Literally has no logic inside it. It's always going to pass without throwing an exception. And so it's going to accept any transaction. And what would be the alternative? What would be the verify that rejects every transaction? Well, that would just be do something like throw a new illegal exception, accepts nothing. And so here we have the complete opposite situation where this contract will not allow any transactions um, involving house state. So it won't even allow issuance of the house state onto the ledger, let alone um, creation or destruction. And generally, obviously, we're going to want to navigate somewhere between these two extremes. We're going to want to write a contract that allows certain transactions that we consider valid, but not others that we consider invalid. And so before we start writing the verify, we want to write some commands. So here we might say, well, we might um, create a command, um, a register command to register the house on the ledger. And all command types must implement this command data interface. And we might define another class as well, um, transfer, which implements the command data interface. And if you remember, command data is a very simple marker interface, just denoting that something is a command type. So now, often the first thing you want to do in a verify is work out what kind of transaction you're looking at in terms of the command. So it's because often the logic you want to impose will be very different between, let's say, registration of a house on the ledger and the transfer of a house on the ledger. So here what we're going to do is that what we want to do is perhaps we want to check, first of all, that there's only one command. So we only have to deal with one thing. That's very easy. Just transaction.gitcommands.size. Um, 
so here we're saying if the number of commands not equal to, sorry, not zero, but one, if the number of commands is equal to one, then throw new illegal argument exception, transaction must have one command. So we've got the start of a verify here. So this verify method is basically saying that any transaction involving a house state must have exactly one command. Now we want to probably grab that command. So here we're just going to get the command and we're going to say, just import that equals transaction dot get command zero, the very first one. And there we have our command. And if you remember, commands pair the list of public keys that are required to sign a transaction with a type. And so here we're going to extract those so we can here get list public key um, required let's just import that required signers equals command dot get signers and the we've also got the type of the command so command data here um, command type equals command dot get value and there you have it. So we have on one hand the required signers of the um, of this transaction, on the other hand the type of the command. And what we want to do now is start to um, modify the logic we impose on the transaction based on the type of the uh, transaction. And so we're just going to use that, use a simple if else condition here. You could do it any way you want. So we can say if command type instance of register, then we want to impose some logic here. So to do registration transaction logic. So we'll take a look at what that would be in a sec. Else if command type instance of transfer, oh, no, transfer, then to do um, transfer transaction logic. And then finally, just to be careful, we also need to put an else here, right? So we need to say, well, if you don't recognize the command type, then throw an exception. Otherwise, Pure could just put in a command of a completely unrecognized type and bypass all the checking. So here we want to say throw new illegal argument exception, command type not recognized. There you, there you go. So there you have it. So now we have our command, um, our, sorry, our verify split into three parts. So if um, it's a registration transaction, we're going to impose one strand of logic. If it's a transfer uh, transaction, we're going to impose another strand of logic. And if it's neither a register or a transfer, we're just going to reject it out of hand. So let's start by writing the logic of the house registration transaction. So the idea here is that we want to have some logic to govern transactions when someone's registering a house on the ledger for the first time, perhaps that can be transferred or modified in the future in some way. So let's go down and just get rid of this to do. And when I'm writing um, contract constraints, I generally think in terms of three types of constraints. First, I have the kind of the shape constraints. So those would be the constraints on the number of inputs, the number of outputs, the number of commands, perhaps their types as well. Then I'd have some content constraints. So that's just inspecting the commands, the inputs, the outputs, and saying, uh, do they have the right values? Are certain things constant? And is that expected? Are certain things changing? And is that expected? And then finally, I'd have some required signer constraints. There we go. So let's start with those shape constraints. Give ourselves a little bit of space here. So when we talk about uh, registering a new house on the ledger, how many inputs are there going to be? Well, there's going to be no inputs, right? Because this is a new house that hasn't been created before, so we're just going to expect zero inputs. So here we're just going to say if transaction dot get inputs states dot size not equal zero, throw new illegal argument exception um, regis um, registration transaction must have no inputs. There we go. Now, how many output states are we going to want? Well, because we're registering the house on the ledger for the first time, we're going to want one output. We're going to want the output that is the new house on the ledger. In theory, you could write a contract that allows the creation of multiple houses on the ledger at once. And so then you might allow 
one or more output states. In our case, each transaction is just going to issue one house. So we're going to say transaction .get output states dot size e uh, not equal one, then throw an exception. So we're saying there must be one output house. Registration transaction must have one output. Just put some full stops in. There we go. And so this is a good reminder that you write the contract, right? There's no built-in constraints. And so if you want to write a house chord app that allows you to register many houses at once, that's completely fine. If you want to write a house chord app where only one house can be registered at once in a given transaction, that's fine too. There's no wrong or right answers. It's just about the logic that you want to allow. And finally, I can check the uh, number of commands. And so actually, this is something we've already done above. So we don't need to repeat that work here. So those are the things I think was kind of the shape of the transaction. How many inputs, how many outputs, how many commands. And we can move on from there. We can actually start to inspect these things. So in our case, we have one output. So let's grab that now. So let's say um, contract state output state equals so I should import that, alt enter, transaction .get outputs, get output, uh, let's get output zero the first. So already know there's one, so this is fine to do. Um, we could also actually not check the number of outputs and just out get the zeroth output. And that in turn, if there was no outputs, would throw an exception. So that could kind of provide the, uh, the contract rejection for us. But it's best just to check the individual cases and then you can provide meaningful error messages and things like that. And now we've got our output state. Well, the first thing we want to know about our output state is, is it a house, right? So what we're going to do is say if output state instance of house state. And annoyingly, so the syntax in Java isn't amazing, but here we're just going to say if not output state instance of house state, throw new legal argument exception, uh, registration, we're just there for shorthand here. Let's just say output must be a house state. There we go. So we have our house state. And we can impose some other rules here. It really depends what we feel like. So we know there's an owner and an address. We might say, for example, um, well, let's grab that um, house state so we can start to look at it. Equals output state. And then we're going to cast that to a house state. There we go. And one rule we could perhaps say here is say if house state dot get address dot length or is it length less than three, let's say. Let's say every address has to be over three characters, then throw it, sorry, we're saying every address has to be more than three characters. So here we're saying if it's less than or equal to three characters, throw a new illegal argument exception. Um, address must be longer than three characters. There we go. But it's important to note that, you know, these are the rules that you're defining. You're the call app developer and you're writing these rules. So there's no right or wrong rules to write. It's about you coming up with a set of rules that define the constraints in such a way that only the transactions you think should be allowed do happen. Um, so you might be in a use case where every address has to be over 10 characters. You might be in a use case where there's a maximum size on the address. Um, you could even go so far as to say if, you know, house state dot get owner dot get name dot get country equals Brazil. Or I um, want to be careful here in Java, so you need to use this equal syntax. Then we could say, well, if the owner is in Brazil, new illegal argument exception, not allowed to register for Brazilian owners, something like that. So again, you're really defining the constraints that you want to put in place. And so in our case, we've chosen some pretty arbitrary constraints around the address and the um, location of the owner of the house. But there we've got it. So we've got some shape constraints. And we've got some constraints on the actual contents of the transaction. And now finally, we want to go and check the required signers. Um, 
This is kind of less arguable. There's more of a clear, obvious constraint to impose here, which is generally that the owner of the house might sign this transaction. But you could also write it so perhaps some, um, you know, some house registry node on the ledger must sign the transaction. You could also say you could look at the nationality of the owner and you could say, well, if this is a European owner, then they have to, one of the required signers must be the European land registry. And if they're Japanese, then it's some Japanese corporation that needs to do the signing, etc. In our case, we're going to keep it simple and say just the owner has to sign the transaction. So here we're going to grab that owner. So we're going to say party owner equals house state dot owner. I remember that a party is a pairing between a name and a public key, the owner of that pub of that identity. So here we're going to say public key owners key equals owner dot get owning key. There we go. And finally here we might say, um, and so we need to actually impose this constraint. So remember we've already got the required signers. And here we're going to say if not required signers dot contains owners key, then throw new illegal argument exception. Owner of house must sign registration. And there we have it. So we've now defined the logic for registration. We've defined the number of inputs and outputs. We've defined um, what the output needs to look like, that it needs to be a house state with a certain address and a certain nationality for the owner. And finally, we've imposed some constraints on who the required signers are in this case. So we're saying that the owner must sign any transaction uh, that is a registration of a house. We're not actually checking the signatures here. That's something, again, that we're going to do in the flow. What we are checking is that the owner is a required signer. And then we'll check their signature separately. And so all that's left now is to implement the other strand of logic for the transfer of a house. And here, I'm going to go a little more quickly. It'll be very similar. But here, we'll see that we can also impose some more interesting constraints on the input and the output. Because now, in a transfer scenario, we're going to have one input, the house that already exists on the ledger, one output, which will be the house we're creating. And we can start to impose some rules about what can change and what can't change in the transfer of that house. So let's start with those shape constraints. Got those here. So we're going to say if um, transaction dot get input states dot size not equal to one, throw new illegal argument exception must have one input. So remember, this is because whereas in the registration we imposed no inputs because there was no existing house to consume. Here we're updating an existing house, so we're consuming the house as it exists now to output the house as it will become. And here we're going to also insist there's exactly one output state. Again, we could, if we wanted to, write this contract logic in a way that you could um, modify or transfer many houses at once. We haven't chosen to do that here just because it makes things a little more complicated. But there we go. We've got two constraints there around shape. And now we can look at the contents constraints. And what we want to do here first, obviously, is to grab those states. So we're going to say um, contract state um, output equals tx.get output zero. And then here we're going to say get input zero, input zero. So again, that'll be a contract state. Contract state input equals transaction to get input zero. Now, the first thing we want to do is check that both the input and the output are actually houses. So that's going to be very super straightforward. Here, what we're going to say is if not input instance of house state, then throw new illegal argument exception. Um, input must be a house state. And if not, so let's just copy and paste that just to save ourselves some time. So here we're going to also say that if the output isn't a house state, then we're going to throw an exception. So now we've got these, this input and this output. We're checking that the input and output are house states. But now we can actually start to do some more interesting stuff. So what we can say is um, um, 
well, let's actually get those um, those house states. So here, house state um, input house equals house state input house state output house equals house state output. And what we can do now is we can impose some restrictions here. So what we can say is, for example, um, if input house dot address equals output house dot get address, and here we have to do not. So if the input house address isn't equal to the output address, then we might throw a new illegal argument exception. And what we're going to say here is say in a transfer the address can't change. And that makes sense as a constraint, okay? So here we're saying when you're transferring a house, you're not transferring it from one location to another, you're transferring it from one um, owner to another. Um, but if you wanted to, you could write this contract in such a way that people could change the address when they transfer the house. Um, but it's it's more what you need to do is work backwards from the use case, the, the business logic, and think about how that business logic maps to code logic. And in this case, I don't know if it makes sense to allow someone to transfer a house's address. But on the other hand, the owner changing is perhaps a requirement. So we might say if input house dot get owner equals output house dot get owner, then throw new illegal argument exception. And this is going to be the opposite, really, of the other one, which is that in a transfer, the owner must change, right? So we're saying that on the one hand, the address can't change, but on the other hand, the owner must change. And again, here, if we wanted to, we could oppose some rules about being Brazilian or some rules about the length of the address. Um, you, it's debatable whether that's required because you've actually already imposed those constraints at issuance, and there's no way to have an existing house state to modify without having at some point issued it under those rules, but you might want to reimpose them here as well. And finally, we can start to look at those required signers. So we can talk about some signer constraints. And what's that going to look like? Well, what we're going to say here is, well, it depends on the logic we want to implement again. So I think we're always going to want the owner of the house currently to sign. So we might say, um, we might get that owner, so skip the owner of input equals um, input owner equals input house dot get owner and party output owner equals output house dot get owner. Now those and so now we can we can impose some rules. So I think it makes sense to say that one of the required signs should be the the owner of the house currently. So if um, if not required signers dot contains input owner dot get owning key. So remember we're talking signers are in terms of public keys, not um, parties themselves. Then throw a new illegal argument exception. Um, a current owner must sign transfer. But here it's up to you. So you could also impose the rule that the person receiving the house has to sign to agree to receive the house. Perhaps the house is a burden in some way. So perhaps here we can also say if um, that the required signers must include the output owner's house. Sorry, the um, owner of the output house. So here, I'm just going to copy and paste that, change that to output new owner here. So that's the way you need to think about transactions, right? So. The, there's the existing states in the proposal, this is the state of the world currently, and there's the new, the output states, which are the state of the world after the transfer. And so here we've imposed that both the input or the old owner and the new owner must sign. So you have it, so now we have our full uh, contract. So it's called the house contract, it implements the contract interface, and implements this one function verify, where we impose rules. And we say, if um, if certain conditions aren't met, then this transaction is invalid. And the way we do that in code is we inspect the transaction object, and if there's anything we're not happy with, if we anything we think should be illegal, then we throw an illegal argument exception.
And right at the bottom here, we have our commands. So we've got a register command for the registration of a house on the ledger and a transfer command for the transfer of the house on the ledger. And inside our contract, we then fork based on the type of this command. So we check there's one command. We get that command. We get its type. Remember, the command has git signers. This is the required signers and git value, the type of the command. Then here we check that command type. And if it's a registration command, we run one set of validation logic. If it's a transfer command, we run another type of validation logic. And right at the end here, if it's neither a register or a transfer command, then we throw an illegal argument exception because the command type is not recognized. So in that case, we reject the transaction out of hand. But that's just an example of how you can write quite complex contracts that based on the commands can handle completely different um, scenarios, handling registration, handling transfer. And we could even extend this to handle the demolition of a house or the update of an address or anything like that.